that time again for another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Phil Huber, joined by Logan and John today. Uh, it's episode number 192. On today's episode, we will be talking about all the fun shop stuff, uh, finishing projects, teaching classes, shop slippers, all that and more. Special thanks to our sponsor. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. All right, a couple of comments from the last episode. Anthony Vincent says, since I'll save that one for the second one. First one is actually from, from Let's warm up first. Yeah. yeah Floyd <laughs> who says, Logan, you know about two ball canes, YouTube channel, don't you? No, but I'm Googling. Yeah. I've seen a couple of his things. Cause when I was looking for a uh, drill press vice mm -hmm. for my, I stumbled across one of his, videos he seems like an older fella okay who does a bunch of machining type mill metal working videos and he is also a gatherer of the <laughs> rare and wonderful okay spirit animal yeah <laughs> okay so i'll put a link to his channel on the show notes page for this episode because he's got some fun stuff. So. Okay. All right. So the second question then, which is going to be a little bit longer, Anthony Vincent writes, is a shaper and a router table pretty much the same thing? Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. Because. Yeah, there's different ways to answer it, I think. Mm hmm. John. I will start with you. <laughs> they do kind of the same thing. I don't know. I think of a shaper as having a, a lot bigger motor in it than what a normal router table would have. Would you say? Or Yes. Yeah. Generally. But I don't know. Shapers are more for shaping and routers are more for routing, I guess. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> why, yeah. why I, why I, think, I started I, yeah. with John. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the discussion ends there, really. Right, yeah. What more can be said? Yeah. So. I, th I, I would say, here's my take on it. Shapers are more for big, heavy profiles versus a router. Um, most shapers use a, well, almost all shapers use a spindle that the cutters then stack on top of. Sure. So instead of talking about it, you know, an inch and a half diameter bit, you're talking about four inch diameter shaper bit. So, um, or you can, can be talking about that. Mm -hmm. Um, you're not going to put a straight bit in a shaper. Uh, although um, some shapers can take a collet. I mean, yeah, mo yeah. Uh, sorry. Vintage shapers, which is where I generally look. Right. Cannot take a collet. Um, okay. Most of those have a spindle. Um, they look scary as shit when you're running. Because <laughs> you got this giant cutter spinning around, you know. Uh, and there's usually a hum to those bit or to those yeah. cutters, too, that it's kind of propeller like. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like making a raised door panel with a helicopter. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> um, you know, I think that. In a production setting, they're probably a lot more efficient than a router table, personally. Because I think that if I was doing, let's just say I'm doing an entire kitchen full of shaker doors, and I want to route, you know, doors, raise panels, whatever, I can load up the appropriate bit on that shaper and turn the power feeder on and just feed it. Whereas I feel like with a router table, 
you're probably going to end up bogging down a bit. You won't be able to move as fast. Um, I guess I don't know exactly what the RPM on a on a shaper is. Like, I have to assume that the RPMs are a little bit slower, which would be a little bit higher torque, but the peripheral speed would be at the same as a, a router table. I don't know this. I'm just completely making that up. But we're going to mm. look right now. Yeah, I think from what I've seen, shapers are in the like 13,000 ish RPMs. Yep. From what I've seen. Although a lot of them have an adjustable speed. A lot of them can also be run backwards. So you can have like cutters that go both that, you know, like will go the opposite direction, mm -hmm. which I think is mostly for Australia, but yeah. I, I could be wrong there. Um, so I'm looking right now, I'm looking at the Harvey one, um, built in four inch dust pour, yada, yada, spindle speed. Interesting. 1700 RPM, 3600, 8500 or 11,000. Okay. So you're definitely slower. Yeah. Uh, maximum tool height is five and a half inches. Can't do that with a router. Um, yeah, interesting. Main motor is a three horse. So at that point, you're talking. <sighs> like there are router motors, I guess, that are rated at three horse. But are they truly three horse? I don't I don't know. They're smaller yeah. horses. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're like, yeah, like Shetland size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shelling horses. Yeah. So. so would you say for most home woodworkers, a router is the better tool? Yeah. Shapers are more for production shops that are making a lot of raised panels, complex moldings, that kind of thing. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'd... I'm not to say that you know, somebody who is just a hobbyist woodworker wouldn't enjoy using a shaper. I just think that there's, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to introduce, I'm not going to teach a woodworking class using a shaper. Um, and I think so somebody that would, would be niche. <laughs> Intro to Shapers 101. Yeah, Shapers for beginners. <laughs> so, I mean, so functionally, I think they do many of the same tasks. Shapers would just be the, the level up boss level tool, whereas a router table is a little bit more... I guess it's like the difference between a Ford Ranger and an F-350. Are they both pickup trucks? Yes. Can you haul stuff in both of them? Yes. But there's a difference in scale. Yeah. And I think the other thing, and I don't, again, I don't know this, but I have to make an assumption that bits for shapers are substantially more expensive. So, I mean, that makes sense. If you're, if you're a cabinet shop and you're doing the same five different styles of doors every single project you're doing, yeah. then that makes sense. But I think when you're looking at, you know, most of us as home hobbyists, you know, we might buy a router bit for a particular project, but that's a 50 to $70 router bit. That's not a several hundred dollar set of cutters. Um, right. I, I do know that they make, they do make really nice, like carbide tipped flush trim bits for shapers. shapers. Yeah. Like, and you're talking like giant, like three inch diameter ones, which just seems like it would be sweet. It's like using a jointer head on its edge. Right. Yeah. So that would be kind of, that would be kind of cool. Um, but there's a reason like, I don't think it's a surprise that I like to buy stupid stuff. I don't have a shaper. <laughs> Yet. 
<laughs> no, well, I mean, I just, I just, I mean, I, I feel I, like I, we have to say that with you every yeah. time because we can go back and look at the <laughs> podcast where I said, Logan, when are you going to get a milling machine? And you're like, no, 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 mm-hmm. no. You're not looking for one. But... I'm not looking for, but if one <laughs> finds me, yeah. yeah. No, like I just, I, I, I honestly, wholeheartedly believe that is a machine that would not get used hardly at all in my shop. Yeah. So. I can see that because. I mean, I mean there, yeah, yeah. Just because of the dedicated tooling involved with it, you know. Whereas, like, a, if you have a router table, all of those bits can work in a handheld router. Yep. Serving multiple purposes in different ways, you know. You have a shaper. Now you are. It's yet another tool that requires a specially you that requires a whole universe of tooling to go with it, whether it's yeah. cutters or, you know, auxiliary fences and collars. And then you start getting into should you get a power feed then at that point and all of that kind of stuff. So um, just as a little bit of on the fly research, you know, looking at infinity cutting tools down in Florida, they have a three piece cabinet door shape up shaper cutter set. So kind of standard raised panel door set. Doesn't tell me what the bore diameter is. Um, Cutters have a three quarter inch spindle bore, but are compatible with half inch spindles using an adapter bushing, which I have to buy separate. The, it's three piece set is three hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. So you, you're so yeah, I mean significantly you're, pricier. Yeah, you're talking a lot more than a router table set. Yeah. So right. Now I do want to go back to and touch on something that you kind of mentioned about uh the shaper because of the flush trim setups that you can get on a shaper with a larger diameter. Mm-hmm. And I would I feel like I just did an article on flush trimming for Woodsmith and in observing how we use flush trim bits around here and how I use them in my shop I feel like if you're going to get a flush trim bit you should get one as big of a diameter as you can get for your router I within agree reason. with that. Yep, I agree with that. Because I've used, and it seems counterintuitive to a certain extent, because you feel like, because you can get like little quarter inch flush trim bits that are pretty small. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can get some some big mamas. Like we got this one uh, in for the article. Let's put a photo of it on the show notes page. It's one of the new... Uh, woodpeckers ultra shear ultra shear so it's got a compression cutting system on there Um, but this one is three quarter inch diameter and i feel like that's a decent size in the sense that at a larger diameter it has more mass but i think Mm -hmm. it can remove material more efficiently than smaller diameter bits can yeah, I agree with that. And I believe that the approach angle of the cutter in your workpiece is at a much, much lower angle, which I think ultimately is going to give you a much smoother finish, in my opinion. Okay. So the bigger the bigger the diameter. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm looking, and I don't necessarily see anything that's labeled as a flush trim bit for a shaper. There is a five inch diameter straight cutting like I mean it's a joiner head on its side, basically. Yeah. Um which look awesome. Um But I feel like I've seen people like uh like Tim Rousseau out in the northeast. Yeah. On some videos he's done either himself or with fine woodworking, where he's had some sort of a flush trim set up with a shaper. Yeah. And, and it's I, a big I, big honking yeah i feel like i've seen that as well so i'm I'm sure there's somewhere just maybe not where i'm looking at um um you know john made a a a good point too you know 
I think I think with most router table setups, you'd be hard pressed to do any form of like larger crown molding. You know, I, there is yeah. there is options when you, when you have the ability to have a five inch tall cutter. Like there are definitely more options instead of doing right. like stacked profiles and all that jazz. You know. Yeah. So, John, I would consider you probably a high level flush trim person because I mm-hmm. feel like a, I've learned a lot from watching you do stuff with flush trim bits. Do you have any have any thoughts there? Uh, no, I agree. I like the the uh, wider diameter flush trim bits. It just seems like there's less chatter on the like you know the finished edge. Um, and the one you showed did that does that have the bearings top and bottom? Yes. Yeah, I like those too because I'm always switch like doing template routing and I'm always switching back and forth like which side mm-hmm. I want to you know come from. So it's nice to have those with the the bearings on on both ends. Yeah. So I think I think that's handy. I also do like the ones with that are spiral or compression like this one has mm-hmm. because I feel like like you were saying there's seems to be different parts especially if it's heavily curved where you're all of a sudden the grain changes and you get mm-hmm. that like Nyip! sound yeah. and it's you get more of a sheer cutting action than just right. the you know the straight cutting action so there's yeah less of that where throw chunks or chip out all right do you guys when you guys are are like flush trimming or pattern routing do you guys prefer to have your pattern on the router tabletop or do you prefer to have the pattern on the top of the workpiece uh, I don't know. It kind of depends which, like if it's a big work piece, uh, I would say on the top of it and route from that direction. If it's a smaller work piece, you know, I'll take it to the router table and have it on the bottom a lot of times, but I don't know. In general, I think I usually prefer having it on the top mm-hmm. because I want to make sure like the router the bits cutters are doing whatever they're going to do. Mm-hmm. I want to yeah. make sure that the bearing is engaged with the template. Yeah. I, I so at the router that. table, I'll use a flush trim bit mm-hmm. and have the uh, template yeah, on top. I guess, again, like unless John was pointing to, like if that changes, then you have to flip it over and mm-hmm. to be able to route kind of with the direction of the grain of the wood. And then handheld, I'll usually use a double bearing bit or a pattern bit and still have the template on top so again, so that I can see that I'm hmm. following that, that the bearing is engaged with the, yeah. with the template. See, I generally like to have the, the pattern on top because then I know like if my cutting isn't like super close to the line and I'm hogging off a ton of material, I can, I can gauge that by how far away the bearing is from the pattern. You know what I mean? Oh, sure. So I can make a lot of little skim passes before making that Mm -hmm. final one. So, you know, talking about shapers kind of adjacent to those are pin routers. You guys ever seen those? like mm-hmm. an overarm pin router. Yeah. I still I struggle sh- with what they do. <laughs> in shop notes, then we have like a shop made pin router. Yes. System and shop. Notes. I'm, it might be a plan now. It was an older one that we grabbed mm. and stand by. Yep. Okay. So See, yeah, a, you guys keep chatting. I'll find out. No, I, I had, I had a friend um, in town here. Uh, that ran a guitar shop, uh, making really, really nice high-end guitars for a lot of big names. Had several employees there. And at one point, um, Bill got a hold of me. He's like, hey, you want to buy a pin router? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you doing with it anyways? Yeah. And from from what I gather, it's more or less for doing, like, pockets and stuff. Or I guess that's what they were using it for. So they were, like, you know, the, the pickups that are routed in inset into the body of the mm-hmm. oh yeah the guitar they're routing those and basically you have like a lexan or plexiglass template that goes on top and then you can follow that with your pin mm-hmm. 
it's another one of those things. There's one actually for sale up in, uh, I think, Ames right now, and it's a big, big brand. Um, it's a big one, a big vintage one. I don't remember the brand on it. Um, Probably Ansrud. I think it is. Yes, I think it is. Um, and they're asking like a song and a dance for it, but I'm like, I, I have no use for it. Like, I don't know when I would ever use that. You know, it's yeah. just one of those things that I know industry use them. I don't yeah. think the home hobby shop uses them or has a use for them necessarily. I think the one in shop notes was shown with uh, you made like uh, lettering patterns with different, oh, yeah. you do different fonts yeah. and stuff, but like cutting out like letters and signs and yeah. you know, shapes, decoration, whatnot. Yeah, I've seen them used for that or joinery work or even shaping. It's basically kind of like having a router table with a flush trim bit or a pattern bit, but flipped on its head. So you can kind of see what's going on. You know, at a router table, it's all upside down and invisible, especially if you're doing relief work. But this was kind of like a fixed plunge router where you just bring the router down. Yeah. And then a pin, mm. the pin engages the, um, engages the pattern and then create or follow follows the template and then the bit does what it's supposed to do so and yes we do have a plan for it so i'll put a link Hmm. to that on the show notes page too interestingly enough grizzly makes a few of them still oh really they do they call them overarm routers um instead of pin routers but that's uh huh okay maybe shraz will have one in his shop we're visiting maybe. him next week. Maybe maybe we'll be able to see one in operation. Okay. What about radial arm routers? Is that a thing? Should That's, be. I feel like the pin router is uh, the radial arm router. Okay. As long as we're explore, exploring that technology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. mm-hmm. uh, a little word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Tight Bond. You want a glue that you can trust, and fortunately, Tight Bond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tight Bond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. You know, it's funny. There, <laughs> there were there there were companies in the past. I'm sure people still make them, but there were companies that made drill presses that had like outrageous speeds on them, like 40,000 RPM. Um, I don't know what they were ever used for, but you could certainly put a router bit in that. Like, would you want to route with it? I don't know, but like, I'm thinking a router bit in the drill press right now. (laughs) You can. (laughs) I've done it. That'd be a good idea. (laughs) Oh God. (laughs) A straight bit in a drill press is an awesome little mortising machine. (laughs) Especially a radial arm one, because then it's a slot mortiser. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For legal purposes, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I did an article. I did an article on it. And okay, if you, it's legit. Um, I have, or we have in the shop here, a old Delta book on like how to get more out of your drill press, mm-hmm. and they show a drill press that looks very similar to Logan's. If it was that styling if it was like a normal drill press yeah but then they show it with putting router bits not just straight bits but like round over bits and whatever in there to do molding but then they also show it where you can take the head off your drill press put it on upside down on the column okay and then turn it into uh basically like a router table i mean if you think about the table on most of those drill presses there's a hole in the center you just top mm-hmm. you know top yep. turvy that bad boy yeah. Woo! <laughs> it's like 2030 mm. yeah so anyway they show all kinds of crazy stuff that you do with drill presses in those books they're they're great fun so hmm yeah, all kinds of 
there was no end to the curiosity and different iterations of old machine tools. It was like, once you put an electric motor on something, all bets were off in the like 1930s or something. I feel like this was long before people got too happy. (laughs) (laughs) And then tort reform caught up with them. Yep. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. All right. Now, before we started on here, uh, Logan, you were talking about shop slippers. Yeah. Yeah. Which I want to know before we see Logan's, if anybody else out there has special footwear for in the shop. Now, I have been a longtime advocate of shop Crocs. Yes, you have. Mm-hmm. Okay. That was when I was in the basement. Just because they're easy to get on and off and I'm just walking around in my socks or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But today, it is, we have like some severe weather advisories. It's like, you know, the rainy season here. Um, It's muddy outside. So I slipped on my little mud hopper boots to walk out here. And I'm like, you know what? I got my shop slippers in there. So I do. I have a pair of shop slippers that I wear. Just leather slip on. Shop slippers, but they got rubber sole on them. Um, they're Cabela's brand, in case anybody's wondering. Uh, I really enjoy them, you know, especially now that while Colin was here last week, I spent most of the time between taking photos for him. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, sealing up the dust collection system, like sealing the joints and stuff. Sure. I'm not kidding you. I bet you I increased the efficiency of the system by 70%. Oh, yeah. It is r- ridiculous. Um, but I now remember that- when we were out there last week filming, you yep. said how much of a difference it makes in terms of just the noise. I don't like the noise or the breath, you know, yep. that you can just hear like air leaking or whatever yeah. from the. Well, it's funny. I actually had a call with um, uh, Jeff. I think Jeff Hill is his last name um, from Oneida. He's their uh, chief operations officer yesterday. Um, just kind of picking his brain about straight piping because I'm gonna I'm doing an article on it. Um, but he said, yeah, he's like the biggest thing people don't realize is yeah, you're losing a lot of efficiency. But he's like, it's a lot of noise. It's a lot of ambient whistling. And he's like, as soon as you get everything sealed up, you'll immediately know if there's a leak somewhere because you can hear the the whistle um, of air sucking through it. Um, but now that I've got this pretty much buttoned up. Um, there's very, very, very little dust that is escaping out of tools, which is awesome. Makes it a whole lot easier to keep this place clean. The floor's not slippery. I don't mind wearing my shop slippers out here. Um, and it's just nice. I mean, it's just nice to walk around on, in squishy, comfortable shoes, you know? Um, mm-hmm. you know, and when I have the radiant floor turned on, the floor is nice and warm. I actually have two pairs of shop slippers out here, but... Yeah. <laughs> One of them is supposed to be in the house, but they're not. (laughs) All right. Yeah. So do you like put them inside like your boots to go inside or are you Mr. Rogers in it when you. I'm Mr. Rogers. Yeah. I'm, I'm kicking them off, putting my boots on, walking in the house. Yep. Especially since I haven't gotten grass to really like, I had a little goat path from the door of the shop into the house and because I keep walking on it, grass is not growing. Okay. So currently there are two 55 gallon drums of sawdust spread out over that area, which is probably not helping my grass grow in case. Probably. Not. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's muddy. It's nasty. You know, after, right after I emptied dust collector out there, um, before the, the sawdust compacts down, you're filling your shoes full of sawdust when you walk into the shop. So, right. We're getting there. Okay. See, now I only have special shop shoes when it's winter. Yeah. I'm outside and I need like boots on to keep my feet from freezing. Yeah. Well, and actually that's when I brought mine out here was during winter. Cause it's like, I, Oh, you know what it was? Uh, so we had Pat Carroll here um, to film our TV show. And I told him, he's like, Hey, I'm going to go out to the shop and sharpen some tools. Okay, all right, cool. Go ahead. Um, I was like, you know, if you bring the dogs, don't let them run through the mud. Well, 
<laughs> he let the dogs run through the mud, and he ran through the mud. <laughs> so okay. he, he got into the shop, and he took his boots off, and I came out here. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I got in the mud. It's like, gosh, Pat, come on. He's like, but I'll tell you what. He's like, this floor is really nice and warm. I was like, well, I haven't, <laughs> haven't walked out here without my shoes on. But I, I took, I kicked my, my shoes off, and I was like, oh, you're right. Like, the floor is nice and toasty. Like, it feels good. <laughs> so that's when, I, that's when I moved my one pair of shop slippers out here to, to wear when I'm out here. So. Plus, okay. they're just comfy. Right. You know, I'm all about little comforts in life. Right. I mean, which people should know because you have shop Crocs. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. Although, have not sprung for the fur-lined shop Crocs yet. That's the next iteration. I'm waiting for Ooh. I'm waiting for a dog to find those Crocs so they can I can order some fur-lined ones. Okay, faux fur for all the animal right. advocates. Yeah, and steel-toed shop Crocs for all the yeah. safety. Oh, people. show. Yeah, oh, I actually got I got an email the other day. We, we occasionally get emails like, you know, top Mother's Day gift items. Get your samples today. Like because we're in the media, right? Uh, yeah. Get all these offers to like, you know, try our new six cents of candles for Mother's Day. You know, do you want a sample? It's like, no, we don't want a sample. <laughs> right. Um, Keen, I think Keen Footwear just sent me one, um, and I don't, I don't want a freaking pair of shoes, but like they're like, hey, new steel toe, vintage style tennis shoes. So like they're like steel toe retro Chuck looking. Taylor's? T- yeah, kind of. Okay. And I'm like, who are you trying to hit here? Like, <laughs> kind of getting the sense that the hipsters aren't really in a steel toe work environment. Wow. I know I'm trying to I'm trying to piss off as many people as I can. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, but I'm like, yeah, interesting. I mean, it's like a couple of years ago when axes were super cool. Like everybody yeah. had a hatchet and an axe, and they had to fix one up and make yep. a new handle for it, and that was Get the a cool thing. Coonskin cap and right. Yeah. I I will be interested to know if anybody that listens. You know, first of all, does anybody listen to this anymore? Second of all. Does is anybody pretty adamant about wearing like steel toe shoes in their shop or composite toe shoes? Right. Like, like I'm very, I'm against like flip flop woodworking. Have I done it? Yeah, but like, <laughs> but I've Birkenstocks. Also, what about Birkenstocks? Will nah, that work? Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a lot of leather on those. But like, like a drop chisel could take a toe. Maybe not yeah. through the bone, but it would it would slice pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um. But, like, does anybody wear <clears throat> true, like, maybe not work boots, but steel toe shoes? Um, I've only had I, – I always do on the sawmill. Sawmill, I'm always wearing steel toe boots because I have had – I had a big, giant sycamore log sat on my foot, and I happen to have steel toe boots on, so it wasn't mm-hmm. an issue. It was just like, hey, I need you to lift this up. Uh, in the shop, I don't, but I think I told you guys when I was getting this rail arm drill press in here, I dropped it on my freaking toe. God, it hurt. Um, you know, surprisingly, the Hey Dude shoes are not steel toe. That's so, weird. I know, odd. So, but made me think about it, and I'm still wearing my shop slippers. But you know, <laughs> yeah, no that that's why I bring it up mm-hmm. is because you'll see videos on YouTube or something like that of somebody's or even instagram where there's some photo of somebody working in their shop and then you see a shot and they've got flip-flops or sandals or whatever and the hate is going to come for not being super safe but i would like to know for real what are people wearing in their shop yeah yeah so john i'm just tennis shoes guy you know i don't even play tennis but <laughs> I'm one of those guys that gets like the same pair of tennis shoes every six months to a year. And then they just go from like, these are my church tennis shoes to these are my shop tennis shoes. <laughs> now they've moved down to the mowing shoes. Or whatever. Yes. So it's yeah. just like levels. And then eventually they get, you know, thrown away and then awesome. move down the line or whatever. But yeah, I'm the same, like same way. If I'm running in and out of the, the garage or the shop or, 
taking the dog out real quick. I'm always just stepping on the back of the shoes rather than putting them on in time. So I probably need to invest in some sort of slip on yeah. equivalent. Just for... So like, like tennis shoes, but like mules mm-hmm. where you just kind yep. of slip into them. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, so Father's Day coming up for all the Doyle kids <laughs> listening to yeah. this podcast here is see if you can find some <sighs> – Find some Saucony mules, mm-hmm. cross training yeah. mules. There you go. All right. Yeah. So yesterday I was out in my shop, had a magazine issue go out the door, and I needed a little alone time. So took the afternoon off and spent some time out in my workshop. And I've realized maybe it's because it was spring. It was a nice day out, sunshine, had the garage door open, the windows in the back open. Uh, I was doing some cleanup, but then also some some woodworking because you can't just clean up in your shop. Otherwise, it just kills the mojo. Mm -hmm. But I've discovered that I've had a lot of things start to creep into my workshop that were filling up the space. Like like extra – like peripheral stuff or woodworking adjacent stuff woodworking adjacent stuff okay not like so kids for, bikes no no okay. thankfully not although okay. i had like a little cargo trail or cargo carrier you know that you yeah. plug into the like hitch, hitch receiver yep yeah um that was kind of sitting back there and i was like that needs a new home that can't be in here yep. anymore so i moved that around um but on youtube i don't know was it early part of this year i did a router table, freestanding router table for my workshop. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a great design. It's a great size, not too big, but it's kind of a space hog in my little shop. So I'm trying to decide if that needs to stay or live somewhere else. Uh, What else is out there? Oh, I had a couple of extra sawhorses. I was cleaning out some stuff in my workroom in the house, you know, kind of where you keep all the plumbing tools and whatever. And had some extra, had the pair of the stacking sawhorses that we've used. And then those got moved out to my workshop and they're handy, but also in the way. And I want to be able to do some more work at home. So I wanted, I got a little laptop stand from you, Mm -hmm. Logan. And then I also rigged up a little, camera mount to be able to do some photos or video work out there and all of those things none of them are big but they're just little space vampires that yep that take up take up floor space so i'm trying to decide what needs to go because my shop isn't getting any bigger now with that attitude it's not <laughs> <laughs> summertime your wife can have her vehicle outside. Mm-hmm. Liberate that mm-hmm. garage, Phil. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that's always a battle that I fight. It's like, okay, haven't used this in months. It needs to go. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that about many things. But then it's like, I'll get on a kick of doing a class and it's like, Oh crap. We use that tapering jig like all the freaking time during this class. So it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, I have, I have storage in here. A lot of this stuff's going to go live in this loft that's up above me, but yeah, there's all these little things that just take up lots of room. And it's like, you don't have a ton of big power tools either. No, you have your bandsaw and drill press bandsaw and, and drill table. press. And the my planer. Yeah, your planer, yep. So Yeah. So can I make it work? Yes, but I also don't want it to be like one of those tile puzzles either every time I do something where it's like I wanna use the bandsaw. Well, I gotta move this out of the way and then move that and Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it was just kind of interesting to see how some of that stuff just kind of creeps in and then little jigs or accessories that I've made for 
you know, like we did a router tenoning jig on the TV show, which I actually think is a really cool jig. Just I don't use it. So, yeah. but then it's, you know, taking up a spot on a shelf somewhere. And how do I, how do I arrange that? So, yeah. The biggest thing that is sucking up, like, just like the biggest vampire in my shop right now is freaking wood storage. I, I, this is like the elephant in the room that I've ignored this entire process of <laughs> planning, designing all of this stuff is, I just, I did not, I did not specifically say this is my lumber area inside the shop, which should I have maybe, but at the same time, it's like, I have that half of the shop that's storage, you know, can lumber live out there until it's ready to come inside. And then, you know, it's a two day process to break stuff down. I, I chop it down let it sit and then start working on it. Probably. Yeah. And that's probably what I'll do, but it's like, you know, I have all these like right next to me and there's all these little, oh, you can't see them. All these little scraps <laughs> just like hanging out, mm-hmm. like she yep. goods behind me, you know, it's just stuff just keeps kind of finding spots to sit. Yep. Oh yeah. So I get it. Cuz I have the same thing. Yep. So there you go. Those are some of the things that I'm dealing with right now. Now that it's mm-hmm. been nice out like multiple days in a row, it's fun to be able to be out there and like the more you work in a space, the you get kind of little patterns of movement or whatever. And you realize, yeah. Oh yeah, this kind of needs yeah. to be clear all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of it being nice out, I think I set a personal record for the earliest I've received a sunburn. Oh, <laughs> like I got completely fried on Saturday. I'm trying not to move a whole mm-hmm. lot because my, my shoulders really, really <laughs> hurt really bad. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. It has been nice to be able to like, there are times where I think, okay, I could have insulated the shop a little bit better. I mean, I it has as much bat insulation in it as I could have put in, but I could have spray foamed it, right? Yeah. Um, the when it's really cold out, I mean, it still gets cold in here, but like this weekend, it was in the mid eighties, um, and really sunny out, and. I was kind of bouncing around outside doing stuff. And then I would come into the shop to grab a tool or something. And it's like, Oh, it's really cool in the shop. So it's like, Oh, okay. That's maybe, maybe this will be okay during the summer. So because last summer I was still working on putting a lot of this together. So I wasn't actually out here like 24 seven working. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd, I'd come out for, you know, an hour to do paneling here or there. And it's like flip the air conditioner on and, it's, it would be fine. I'd go stand in front of the air conditioner, you know, trying to dry off for a few minutes, uh, and that would help. So, I don't know. We'll see. It is nice to be rolling into summertime, though. Mm-hmm. I would agree. All right. So, two questions for everybody, then, for audience participation is and classroom participation as well. That's 28% of your grade is what's your shop footwear and do you have any workshop warm weather slash summer goals for what you're going to be doing out there? You can send us uh, an email, woodsmith at woodsmith.com to let us know. Put it in the comments section on our YouTube channel. And again, a special thanks to Typebond for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, with all the different glue choices that they have, there's got to be something for you. Uh, for example, I need a new bottle of liquid hide glue. Just ran out. So I'm going to be picking up one of those here in, in the near future. So thanks for listening, everybody, to the Shop Notes podcast, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.